This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be mostly about continued fractions. Um, so um, we're going to be using them to solve um, Pellian equations. I'll just give a <coughs> quick bit of background. What we want to do is to solve equations um, um, in several variables where f is some sort of polynomial. And the complexity depends on the degree of f, which can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Ones of degree 1 are called linear, because they sort of give the equations of lines. Ones of degree 2 are called quadratic, because they've got squares in them, and squares are called quadratic things. Degree 3 are called cubics. Um, degree 4 are called quadratic. Um, quadrics and so on. And unfortunately, this terminology is a bit of a mess. We can also talk about the number of variables. And if there's one variable, this is kind of very easy to solve because it's just a polynomial and you can, in one variable, so you can find its roots over the reals and so on. So um, if it has two variables, this is called a binary. Um, polynomial. If it's three variables, it's called ternary, and so on. Um, now, degree one um, polynomials are rather easy to solve using Euclid's algorithm, and polynomials in one variable are rather easy to solve. So the um, next, first sort of non-trivial case is um, degree two um, polynomials in two variables. Um, and these sort of look like ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals zero. And by making changes of variables, um, you can sort of get rid of the linear terms. You just change x to x plus a constant to complete the square and get rid of that. And you do the same for y. Um, so what we have to do is to solve an equation of form ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared equals some constant. So this bit here, as I said, is a binary quadratic form. And the next few lectures are going to be mostly about binary quadratic forms. Um, so uh, a very famous example of this is the Pellian equation. Um, which we want to solve x squared minus dy squared equals 1. Um, the, it is named after this guy called Pell, who had absolutely nothing to do with solving the equation. The, the name is some sort of historical accident, but it's, it's kind of stuck, so that's what everybody calls it. Um, so uh, it was actually solved many centuries before Pell. I think one of the first people to solve it was this Indian mathematician, um, Brahmagupta, um, he, he was in about 650 AD, so this was really very early. Uh, it was you know, almost a thousand years before Europeans managed to solve this equation. And he said one who can solve the equation x squared minus 92y squared equals 1 within a year is a mathematician. If you try and solve it by trial and error, um, you're probably not going to manage it, at least not if you do it by hand. Um, so we want to... Um, find a way to solve equations like this. And if, if you think about this, this, this equation says that x squared minus 92y squared is approximately zero. Um, so that means x over y squared is approximately 92. So x over y is approximately the square root of 92. So what we have to do is to find a rational number um, rational number x over y close to this number, the square root of 92. And this is a very general problem in mathematics. You want to find a good rational approximation to some real number. And there's a good technique of doing this using continued fractions, which I'll illustrate as follows. So as you take the number pi, and we want to find a good rational approximation to it with x and y integers. Well, we can take pi, well, let's take the integer part of it. It's approximately 3 plus something, where this is, you know, 0.14159 and so on. 
And we're going to write pi as a continued fraction. Now, a continued fraction means you want to write pi as um, some integer plus 1 over some integer plus 1 over some integer plus 1 over some integer, and so on. And it's fairly obvious how we can do this. We take this number here and we write 1 over this bit here is equal to, um, well, it's going to be about 7 plus some remainder term. And then you take 1 over this bit here and it will be, it's about 15 plus something. And then this something, 1 over this something is about 1 plus something. And you know, 1 over something turns out to be about 292 plus something. And so pi is going to be approximately 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 292 and so on. And when you've got a continued fraction like this, it's quite easy to find a good rational approximation. For example, here's the first rational approximation. What you notice is that 1 over 15 plus something is approximately 0. I mean, well, you know, because 15 is quite a large number. So we find that pi is approximately 3 plus a seventh, which is the well-known classical approximation to it. But you can do better than that. You, you notice this number 290, 1 over 292 is, is, is even closer to zero. So pi is going to be approximately 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over 1. And if you work out what this is, it turns out to be 355 over 113, which is a very famous um, approximation to pi found several hundred years ago and it's it, 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 it's quite good because it's got three digits here but it gives it gives pi correct to to, to, to more than so, so it's got six digits here but it actually gives pi correctly to more than six digits so this is about 3.1415929 or something and pi is actually 3.1415926 so you see it's got one two three four five six seven digits correct even though you've only used six digits in the approximation so anyway so continued fractions are a really neat way of finding good rational approximations to numbers um, now let's go back and solve the Pellian equation x squared minus 92y squared equals 1. Um, and first of all, we notice that 92 is actually divisible by 4. So we can try solving x squared minus 23y squared equals 1, which is going to be a bit easier because 23 is smaller. And if we're lucky, y will be even, and then we'll have a solution to, to this by dividing y by 2. Um, and if it isn't even, well, we, we, we'll see what we can do about that. So, so let's, let's first solve this. Well, we expand 23 as a continued fraction. So you get out your pocket calculation. You find the square root of 23 is about 4 plus some error term that I'm not going to worry about. And 1 over this error term is about um, 1 plus something. And 1 over this something is about... Um, um, 3 plus um, something and you continue like this and you find the square root of 23 can be expanded as something like 4 plus 1 over um, 1 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 8 and so on and you keep going like this and you can um, take various bits of this and see how, how good they are as a solution to this. For instance, you might say 3 is quite large, so we try saying root 23 is about 4 plus 1 over 1. Well, that's that's going to give us, um, um, this is going to give us the number 5, so we get 5 squared um, minus 23 times 1 squared equals, well, that 2. Well, well, 2 is a little bit too big. We actually want this to be equal to 1, so, so this approximation isn't quite good enough. Well, how about we try, um, you know, there, there's this quite large number 8 here. So, so, so let's try setting this equal to 0. So we get that the, the square root of 23 is about 4 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 1. And now you can work this out. Well, that's um, 4 plus 1 over um, 1 plus 1 over 4. 
and 1 plus 1 over 4 is 5 over 4, so that's 4 plus 4 fifths, which is equal to 24 over 5. And now if we try this, we find 24 squared minus 23 times 5 squared um, um, is, uh, or 24 is, is, is 576, and if you subtract 23 times 25, that's 575. So this is equal to 1. So we've solved our original equation here. And all we need is for this number 5 to be even, and then we can solve x squared minus 92 squared y squared equals 1. Well, um, unfortunately, as you probably noticed, the number 5 is not even. So um, what do we do about this? Well, it turns out we can actually find lots of other solutions to this equation if we've got one of them. So here we've got 24 minus 23 times 5 squared equals 1. And I'm going to write this as um, 24 um, minus 5 square root of 23 times 24 plus 5 times the square root of 23 is equal to 1. And now you notice if I've got a minus b root 23 times a plus b root 23, that's going to give me a solution of a squared minus 23b squared equals 1. Um, and what I can do is I can just square this. Um, so we, we, we get 24 minus 5 root 23 squared times 24 plus 5 root 23 squared is also equal to 1. Um, and now what I do is I, 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 I can just write this as something plus something times um, the square root of 23. Um, and if you square this out, it turns out to be 115, uh, sorry, 1151 um, minus 240 times the square root of 23 times 1151 plus 240 times the square root of 23. Now this is equal to 1. Um, and now you see we've now got another solution of x squared minus 23y squared equals 1. We've got 1151 squared minus 23 times 240 squared is equal to 1. And now this is now become even, so we can solve our original equation 1151 squared minus 92 times 120 squared is equal to 1. Here I've just multiplied this by 4 and divided this by 4. So we found a solution of, of um, the, the, the original equation. Um, so um, now what I want to do is to do a rather more complicated example just to show you um, how, how bad things can get. So this time I'm going to do x squared minus 67y squared equals 1. And I'm going to do it a little bit more explicitly. Um, so, so let's write out the continued fraction. Well, we have the square root of 67. And now I'm going to do everything explicitly with, with integer arithmetic. So the square root of 67 um, is equal to, um, let's leave a bit of space here, 8 plus the square root of 67 minus 8. Uh, divided by 1. Um, and um, so th 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 this is the start of the continued fraction. And then I take the inverse of this. So 1 over the square root of 67 minus 8 is equal to um, the square root of 67 plus 8 over 3, which is equal to 5, plus the square root of 67 um, minus 7 over 3. Um, and um, if you work out the, 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 what you get as a solution to the equation here, 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 we, here we've got the square root of 67 is about 8. So we try 8 squared minus 67 times 1 squared, and this is equal to minus 3, and that's no good. We want this to be equal to 1. And here, um, if we look at the continued fraction, um, 8, we would have 8 plus a fifth, and that, if we work that out, that's giving us 41 squared minus 67 times 5 squared, uh, that doesn't work either. That's equal to 6, which isn't 1. So, so this, is, this is using the approximation root 7 is about 8. This is using the approximation square root of 67 is about 8 plus 
1 over 5, which should be um, 41 over 5. So we get 41 and 5 there. So um, that doesn't work. So we don't give up. We go on to the next term, which is 3 over the square root of 67 minus 7, which is equal to the square root of 67 plus 7 divided by 6, which is equal to 2 plus the square root of 67 minus 5 over 6. And let's see what we get here. Well, um, here we now get 90 squared minus 67 times 11 squared is equal to, well, minus 7. That's no good either. And here we're using the, the, the approximation of 8 plus 1 over 5 plus 1 over 2 for the square root of 67, which is 90 divided by 11. Well, if that doesn't work, we just keep going. So the next one is 6 over the square root of 67 minus 5. And I'm going to miss out some of the calculation because it's getting a bit boring. This is going to be 1 plus square root of 67 minus 2 over 7. And if you work out what we get here, we actually get a 9. Um, let me write these out. That's 1 over 31 squared minus 67 times 16 squared, which is equal to that. And now um, working out the continued fractions is getting a bit tedious, but there's a, there's a quicker way of doing it. What you notice is there's actually a recursion relation for each of these numbers. So 90 is equal to 2 times 41 um, plus 8. So the, the 41 and the 8 are here, and the 2 is here. And similarly, um, 11 is 2 times 5 plus 1. So the 5 and the 1 are here, and, and this 2 is here. So we're getting a sort of recursion relation for these numbers, um, depending on this number here. For example, um, here we would use this number 1 and we would get 131 is equal to 1 times 90 plus 41. So there's the 90 and the 41. And similarly, we get 16 is equal to 1 times um, 11 plus 5. So there's the 11 and there's the 5 and there's the 1. So, so we can work out these numbers here using, using a simple recursion relation. Um, and let's do a few more. So we get 7 over the square root of 67 minus 2, which is... 1 plus the square root of 67 minus 7 over 9. And here we would get 221 squared. And here we get 27. And we get a minus 2. And you notice the 221 is 1 times this plus this. And 27 is 1 times that plus that. And the next one is 9 over the square root of 67 minus 7. And here we get 7 plus the square root of 67 minus 7 over 2. And here we get a 9, so that's no good. We do a few more. 2 over the square root of 67 minus 7 is equal to 1 plus the square root of 67 minus 2 over 9. And that's no good. We get a minus 7 there. And we get a 9 over the square root of 67 minus 2. And this is equal to 1 plus the square root of 67 minus 5 over 7. And does that work? No, we get a 6 there. Um, and... Um, the next one is 7 over the square root of 67 minus 5, and this is equal to 2 plus the square root of 67 minus 7 over 6, and we get a minus 3 here. And you wonder, how long is this going to go on for? Well, if you stare at it, you see there's something funny going on. Look at these numbers here, minus 3, 6, minus 7, 9, minus 2, 9, minus 7, 6, minus 3. Can you see a pattern? Well, one pattern is that it's kind of symmetric. So um, these numbers here are all the same. And, and, and this is sort of seems to be in the middle of something. So we seem to be coming to the end because, you, you, you know, we, we started with minus 3, 6, minus 7, 9, and now we're going back down again. And this suggests we should be getting to something, something interesting fairly soon. Um, so the next one is 6 over the square root of 67 minus 7. And this is giving us 5 um, plus the square root of 67 um, minus 8 over 3. And now the number we get is 1. And that shouldn't be too surprising because actually I missed out a number at the beginning here. We actually had a solution 1 squared minus 67 times 0 squared is equal to 1. I mean, this equation does have a rather trivial solution, x equals 1, of course, which is not the one we're interested in. Um, so... Um, 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 this 1 here 
corresponds to this one here. Now we've finally found a non-trivial solution. And now if you work at all these numbers here, which I won't bother doing because it's not terribly interesting, you find this number here is, is, is actually 48842 squared minus 67 times um, 5967 squared is equal to 1. So we found a solution of this um, equation, um, which but by hand, and as you see, you, you wouldn't have been able to find this by hand by trial and error. It's, it's just too big. Um, so um, continued fractions give a very efficient way of finding quite large solutions of, of Pellian equations. Um, and if you look at this, um, you can see there are several other patterns going on. Um, for example, um, these numbers, you know, 6, minus 7, 9, minus 2, 9. Well, if you look at the, the denominators here, you're getting 6, 7, 9, 2, 9, 7. So they're the same numbers, except with, with signs every second step. And as we, as we said before, there's another pattern that if you look at these numbers here, they're giving the recursion relations for these numbers here. So you can work these out by some simple recursion relations. Um, and if you write them out, you, you can find several other patterns going on. Um, and really the best thing to do to understand these is, is, is not to watch somebody else do it, but to do an example yourself. So let me give you a, 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 an example if you want to practice on. So, so here's a sort of exercise. Let's do x squared minus 61 squared. 61 times y squared equals 1, and we want to find a non-trivial solution. Um, I should warn you that the solution to this is actually really rather large, and if you manage to do this by hand, you, you, are, being, you are extremely patient. Um, but it does work in the end. Um, by the way, um, the re the, 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 there's a problem we didn't um, solve, which to show that this process actually terminates. Um, I'm not going to prove that because the proof is a little bit messy to follow, but becomes kind of obvious if you do this calculation by hand and, and sort of understand what's going on. The, the point is you can find all these numbers here are bounded um, by roughly the square root of 67. Um, so there are only a finite number of possibilities for what you get here. So eventually, this process must cycle. And once it cycles, it just keeps on cycling. And if it's cycling, you can cycle it backwards. And you can cycle it backwards and get to the one that you started with up here. So if you cycle forwards, you must also get to a one eventually. So rather than give a proof that this terminates, I will say if you actually try it on an exam a couple of examples, you will sort of understand it so well that you can kind of see that it always terminates. Um, I should just say a little bit more about how you can find an infinite number of solutions. Now the, the problem with this example here is that although it has an infinite number of solutions, the infinite number of solutions get rather big. For instance, the next one is 4771081927 squared minus 5828804288 squared times 67 is equal to 1. And I, I don't want to have to deal with numbers like this. So I'm going to do a much smaller example to illustrate how to find infinitely many solutions. So let's just do x squared minus 3y squared equals 1. And this is a very simple solution. Um, x equals 2, y equals 1. So now I want to show you how to generate an infinite number of solutions from this. So um, we just copy what we did for 92. We, 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 we observe that 2 plus root 3 times 2 minus root 3 is equal to 1. And now we can just raise both sides to the power of n. 2 plus root 3 to the n times 2 minus root 3 to the n is equal to 1. And this will be a plus b root 3. And this will be a minus b root 3, and this will be equal to 1. So we find that a squared minus 3b squared equals 1. So this gives, a, gives us a new solution of this for every value of n. So, so let's just do the first few. So 2 plus root 3 
squared is equal to 7 plus 4 root 3, and we find 7 squared minus 3 times 4 squared is equal to 1, that's 49 minus 3 times 16, which is 48, and 2 plus root 3 cubed um, is equal to 26 plus 15 times the square root of 3, so we find 26 squared um, minus 3 times 15 squared is equal to 1, so that's, you know, that's 576, that's 3 times 225, and so on. So, um, um, we can generally find an infinite number of solutions of x squared minus dy squared equals 1, unless we obviously can't. So we, we certainly want to take d to be not a square, for example, otherwise there are no solutions at all. But if d is a square, then the continued fraction thing kind of breaks down because the square root of d is already an integer. Um, so that shows um, how to use continued fractions to solve this equation. Um, um, what we're going to do in the next lecture is look in a bit more detail at more general quadratic forms. So in general, we want to solve the equation ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared equals some constant. And to do this, we'll be studying these binary quadratic forms in more detail.